Hello, everyone. Today with us, I am so excited to have Steve Stewart, who is not only completely debt free, but a great friend of mine. And I've learned so much from him over the years, and I'm excited to share his story with you. Steve, how are you doing today? I'm fantastic. Lots of craziness going around here, but uh, thank you for having me on, Deacon. Yeah, I was complimenting you on your background. I can recognize some of those shirts. Uh, what's the story behind that? Yeah, well, over the years, been attending conferences, and uh, some of my clients make T-shirts, so I get some of their stuff, just as either a souvenir or as a you know maybe they give me a gift. And I've gotten way too many T-shirts. And my wife one year said, you know, you really need to have a better backdrop in your room. I have an idea, and so she's uh, she created this T-shirt wall, and it's just basically squares of all these wonderful shirts that some of them I can no longer wear. Uh, some of them are. are like this green one over to my left shoulder, your right, is going to be a, a collector's item. It's from an old DJ gig I did years ago. But yeah, it's kind of neat to see those in the wall. It's yeah, I, I love it. I love the creativity. So let's start kind of winding back to maybe when you and your wife, you're trying to figure out your money, your finances. Um, what made you decide to even tackle your debt in the first place? Well, I had a day job that kept me on the road a lot, and I bumped into Dave Ramsey on the radio and uh, was kind of intrigued by this guy yelling at his audiences that needed to cut their credit cards and pay off their mortgages early and ignore the credit score. And I was like, no, that's wrong. You know, everything everyone, everything I've ever heard is opposite of that. And I dug into it. I'm like, yeah, you're right. You know what? He's right. And he was even, you know, reciting some scripture, and I, I went against the Bible, and I was like checking that out, and I realized, yeah, that's there too. So there was a lot of conviction that came. It was the early 2000s when that happened, but it wasn't until three years later. I thought we were doing it fine. I didn't cut up my credit cards. I didn't uh, you know, pay off the cars that quick, but my wife wanted a, a new Jeep. So we went and borrowed money on a Jeep. And I was like, wait a minute, I've known this stuff. I've been convicted of this stuff. Why aren't we doing this stuff? So it was right around 2006 that we had this, this new Jeep with about a $12,000 loan. Back then that was a lot of money. And I was like, that's it, I'm done. We're going to do better than this. We aren't going to be average anymore. So we uh, every every side gig dollar that I, I had, I was a DJ at the time, every side gig dollar that I made that year, we put right towards that Jeep and paid it off in 13 months. And that was the last consumer debt we've ever had. That is awesome. Now, when you say DJ, what does that mean? Were you at weddings? Were you doing like raves? What's going on? Yes, yes, all of the above. Uh, used to be a nightclub DJ. Also did a lot of DJ gigs for uh, you know weddings and parties. And then around that time was mostly corporate events. Which uh, a guy here in St. Louis, he's a great salesman. And whenever he had extra gigs, he'd send me these incredible corporate events. There was one uh, I did a couple of years in a row. It was the uh, Smyrna uh, Auto Plant, and there was you know anywhere between five and fifteen thousand people that would show up out at this big complex, outdoor complex, and just man, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I love that. You know what's funny is, so I can relate to the side gig thing. One of the things that we were doing um, that I never thought I would do is I had a friend that would work at these food conferences. Um, like think of uh, convenience stores, like everything on the sun, Circle K, 7-Eleven, that kind of stuff. So it's like the food that literally gets sold in these stores and they'd have like caramel M&Ms before they even come out and that kind of thing. Well, they had this nonprofit attached to it and he would pay me about a grand a weekend to go man this booth. And I'm like, I would have never in a million years thought like that I would do that. But when I was focused on paying off my debt, I just was like, hey, any money, extra money I get like this is going to go towards paying off our debt. So I love that about your story. Now, OK, so we're talking about the Jeep. Uh, you pay that off, but you still you still have debt, right? You still have a house. Where did you go from there? Yeah, at that time, we still had the mortgage, uh, which we did end up paying off early, but that wasn't until 2015. So, but why would you pay your house off early, right? Like people have that argument that you can put the money in the stock market, make more money. So why would you even pay your house off to begin with? Yeah, for me, it was two reasons. One was the conviction uh, of, of debt. I just, I don't believe in debt anymore. Mortgages, I'm a little less severe on, but anything else, I'm just like, no, get rid of it. Uh, but then the other was just the simplicity of life. Once we paid that thing off, you just, this, this weight that you didn't know was there just sheds off of you. And you're like, oh my gosh, I don't have to, I don't have anything except my nor my normal monthly bills. And until you're there, I mean, a lot of us were there when we were teenagers and we were living with our parents, but until you're there as an adult, I mean, it's a completely different experience. You don't know what it's like just not to have to worry about anything like that. So we cut up, I cut up all my credit cards in 2008, haven't had a credit card since. No debt since 2008, except for the mortgage. And then once we paid off the mortgage 2015, I mean, man, this has been a great 
fantastic, you know, what has it been, eight years now? I can't even do the math. Eight, nine years. Yeah, yeah, eight, nine years. So one of the things I think that might be like resonating with people is like, okay, pl completely debt free, but what, what about your credit score? What about credit cards, right? Like, do you, how, what does life look like when you have no debt? You want to start with the credit cards, the credit score? <laughs> yeah, let's start with the credit cards. So yeah, like credit... you, you're going to a hotel and they're like, put your credit card down, right? You're going to yeah, you know, what's that look like? You know, I, I, I was challenging that back then too. And it's gotten so much easier now to do just about everything with a debit card that you could do with a credit card. You have almost the exact same fraud protections. In fact, in this household, we've had three debit cards compromised, but we have a family member that had a credit card compromised. Now with our debit cards, we got everything back. Everything was, you know, fine, no problem. And there was no loss of money there, no real problem. But then with the credit card or their, our family member, they told the credit card company is supposed to stand by this visa, you know, zero liability policy that they tout up all the time. They said, oh, you have to call that company that's got the fraud thing and, and tell them, you know, you have to deal with it yourself. I'm like, well, wait a minute. My bank, who wants to keep my business really bad, works with me hand in hand on my debit card. Here, this credit card company, which is supposed to, you know, be you don't want a debit card because fraud protection. We have fraud protection. They didn't really stand by that policy very well. And it wasn't even a big amount. So I'm just like, what a pain in the butt that was. I don't need a, de a credit card. I can do everything the same. I can shop on Amazon. I can buy things. I can travel with my debit card. And there's some slight restrictions, but for the most part, I haven't had a real issue. Um, and I found it a lot easier to deal with those slight issues than to deal with what I had to deal with when I had credit cards. Now, if you want to move on a credit score, yeah, who cares? Who cares? Until I'm ready to borrow money. Other than that, it doesn't matter. I'm not trying to get a better rate on a credit card. I'm not trying to, you know, um, what, what else do you use a credit card for? Everybody says you use it for, you know, uh, renting a car. Okay, well, I've rented cars with debit cards before. They say you need a, a credit score to rent an apartment. Well, we're, we're, we don't need to do that. Um, what else? What else is there? Obviously the mortgage. Yes, okay, so get, to get a mortgage, yes, you might want a credit score, but there are other ways that I've learned to be able to qualify for a mortgage, show, showing my credit worthiness without a total, I don't have a credit score at all. So I, I haven't found a reason that I need to have a credit score and I certainly don't spend any time and energy on it like you see in all the media and all the conversations people have. Oh, my, my credit score is gonna hurt. No, don't worry about it. So the one thing that I think people will say, uh, and, and I'm curious to get your perspective is, okay, well, what if I get in a financial pinch and it's a large financial pinch mm -hmm. and I need to borrow money, I need, right? I want to borrow money, but I don't have a credit score now. I haven't used my credit in forever. What do I do? Yeah, I get that. I mean, if you don't have any money to deal with it, then there's one of two ways you go. You borrow the money, which is going to put you in a pinch, or you're going to negotiate some terms with whoever it is. And the only two that are really tough would be the IRS or if you're about to lose your home. But if you don't have money to pay your mortgage, there's, there's other things going on. If you don't have the money for your taxes, you can work on an arrangement with the IRS. If you don't have money to pay for, uh, what's the emergency? If you get in a car wreck and stuff, you gotta hit, hit your deductible. You're gonna find ways to make payments or arrangements so that it's not one big chunk of $10,000 that you have to come up with at the time, medical debt. That's always, uh, not always, but for the past at least decade, probably two decades, you work that out with the hospital or the doctor, make payment arrangements so that it's not this one big chunk of $10,000 or whatever the dollar amount might be. Other than that, if it's a $2,000 or $1,000 thing, man, let's get some savings put aside. Now, yes, I, I was lucky. We had savings put aside. So we were able to go through this journey of getting out of debt and not having to worry about credit score and all that stuff because we did have some cash put aside for those emergencies. But $10,000 might be all that it was that allowed me to be comfortable to say, I don't need credit cards. I don't have to worry about a credit score. Let me just live my life debt free and work towards the future and not have to worry about what might happen. Yeah, so that's actually what I was kind of hinting towards and you got to, which is, okay, so you pay off the Jeep, you pay off your house, now you have extra money, right? So part of that probably was putting it in savings. Did you have a number in mind where you're like, if we had this much in savings, we'd be good? Yeah, 10,000 was a nice round number. 
you know, if or you want to do a come formula. Up with that number, like randomly, or did you have like well, a? Well, it, we were following Dave Ramsey's plan back then. We still kind of are now. I mean, well, when you're in baby step seven, you've already done the plan. There's not much more to do. Uh, and our daughter, we just she just moved out a couple months ago. She graduated college just earlier last year. The number that we were coming up with at the time was based on that three to six months of expenses that Dave Ramsey talks about. But he's not the only one. Susie Orman talks about six months or more. Um, I'm sure that Clark Howard does. There's a lot of people that talk about that. And even in, in our space, the people who are, are just writing blogs and stuff like that. It's a good rule of thumb because if you're out of work or something big happens, you want to have some savings put aside. If you're out of work for three to six months, you want to have the money put aside to pay the bills. Not for putting more money into retirement and savings, but for bills. So we've, we figured that out to be about $10,000. So we've made that, that the dollar amount. It's now more about thirteen. dollars even though our expenses have morphed and changed since that original number. So 13 is actually, if you think about it, kind of a low number. But it's also because that that number doesn't include any debt payments. There's no mortgage that I have to pay for because that's paid off, that we own the house free and clear. So all I have to worry about is taxes, normal monthly bills, you know, my wife's Netflix and my Peacock or subscription or whatever it is, you know? <laughs> so that's a really good segue. So what would you say is your biggest expense now? If you don't have a mortgage anymore, what's the biggest expense you have? Groceries. <laughs> it's always groceries. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's groceries. My wife loves to cook, so she always buys the good ingredients, the good meats. And to get two people, now it's two people. To get two people fed here in the house is ridiculous, but that's our biggest expense. No, but that's a great place to be, right? It's like, I think a lot of people probably watching or listening to this can say, gosh, I wish groceries was my least expensive, you know, I mean, some people, it could be their car. A lot of people, obviously it's the mortgage. Um, you referenced your daughter, she moved out, but I, I know you had told me something about her buying her first car and she <laughs> wanted to pay cash, but you, you didn't really want that or for whatever reason. So tell me about that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So my daughter had my, my wife's, uh, previous car and it was a well taken care of uh, Nissan Pathfinder. It was like a 2004 and this was back when my daughter was 21, so just a couple years ago. So it was a good, you know, 16 year old car and there's no reason for her to buy a car, but she was looking. My daughter was looking. She's like, dad, I think I want this car. She's, she's looking online. She finds one. This is a nearby dealership. She pulls it up. She's like, mom and dad, I'm, I think I might want this car. She shows us. It's a 2011 Chevy Camaro unbelievably awesome sports car just a, you know a beautiful car i'm like no way is my 21 year old daughter going to be driving around a sports car like that no way but i can't say no i mean just got to find a reason right can't just be big old bossy guy and tell her no so she's like dad will you go test drive it with me I'm like ah there's my out good let's go test drive it let me see if i can find something wrong with it so we go and we test drive the thing i'm having her back it up we're going on the interstate we're doing all the things we get back to the dealership after the test drive and i'm thinking okay She's been saving up her money from her part-time job and digital art that she does online. She's got the money for it to pay cash, and she knows she wants to pay cash for it. So I can't argue with debt uh, or with the debt with the debt angle. The car is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not a new car. It's not like it's going to depreciate anymore. The only reason I could come up with for her not to buy the car is because it's the car I wanted. Mm. So <laughs> I was like, honey, I can't stop you. You're going to pay cash for it? Do it. And that was the thing. It was such a great learning lesson for her to be able to just go and write this huge check. I mean, she got a money, a cashier's check from the bank. But to go up there and, and you know, basically pay cash for a car, your first car that you wanted. To, and she loves this thing. She actually wrapped it a pink color now. So it's actually like Barbie. This, this is before Barbie got big again, but sure. it's a Barbie pink and she loves it. That's incredible. So I love that though, because you've passed this this money management on to the next generation, to your daughter. She's applying it. And you had like this internal struggle of like, I don't want my daughter driving a race car. Like maybe it's could be too dangerous or too flashy or whatever the whatever the case may be. And then you go deeper and you say, Well, actually it's something that I wish I could have had, but I couldn't because of the way that I handled money. That's my assumption. Um and, and then you you kind of not to say gave in, but you let go and you said, Hey, she saved up for it. She's done the things that I've taught her to do. Why shouldn't she enjoy that? And so I yep. just love that about that story. Um, so what, 
What were you doing before you you got into that other than DJ? You said, hey, I, I was working, but we didn't really get into that. I think it's important because I know what you do now and kind of want to bridge that gap. Yeah. Uh, so there's a there's a you know a salary type job. I was doing internal auditing for a company who had me going to their locations in in the Midwest and the franchisees owners to audit their paperwork and their procedures. So there's a lot of traveling back then and the DJing was on the side as well. Uh, let me go through the whole story though because this will take us to where I am now. So that in 2007, I decided, you know what, I wanna start this blogging thing and I really like this financial thing so I started a financial blog. But I also was listening to podcasts because podcasts were starting around 2005, 2006 and I was driving a lot. It's like, oh, I got this iPod, let's fill it with stuff. Fell in love with the medium of podcasts so I started one of my own in 2010 and was interacting with a few other people in the in the personal finance space and found out about this conference called FinCon. That's where I met you, Deacon, and started just going to FinCon and, and encouraging others to start podcasts. Uh, just because I love the medium as much, I thought, there's all these bloggers. Out there. They got great content. They could totally relate with an audience. Let's get their face and their voice on a blog. And was just encouraging people to do that. And then uh, a couple of financial bloggers, famous people, uh, got together. They were like, talking about doing a show themselves. And they finally realized, you know what, we've got to get some help here. Let's call Steve. Steve's always encouraging people to start a podcast. Let's ask him some questions. And by the end of that conversation, they're like, Steve, we just want to hit record. We do the rest. I'm like, sure, I could do it, but I got to charge you for it. Lo and behold, we launch a show. These two really well-named bloggers, Paula Pan from Affording Thing, Jay Money from Money uh, from Budgets for Sexy. They started the show, we launched it, and of course they have big email lists and people heard about it and exploded. Other people in the FinCon community heard about it and like, oh, we hate editing our stuff, let's call Steve. So by m the middle of 2016, I had to give up everything that I had been doing. I had already left the day job because I was trying to make my financial coaching business work and it just kind of straight lined, it didn't do anything. Even though I gave it 80 hours instead of 40 a week, it just kind of straight lined. So I, I had the ability, the extra time to to start a new side hustle as a podcast editor. And it just ballooned into a career that I'm still doing today. And I love it. Now, let's 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 dive into that, because I think you kind of casually went through it. But like if I was to give you a, a one through 10 scale, say, how much did you do love in internal auditing? <laughs> of one to 10. I did enjoy it, but it was a lot of travel. So if you put the whole job on a scale, I'd say four or five. Okay. And then podcast editing, editing, same thing. One to 10, you're like, how much do you enjoy what you do now? Getting paid to listen to my friends talk about money topics. Let's say, hmm, it's, it's up there in the nine scale for sure. Okay. See, I Plus, love the honesty there because I think some people probably go right to 10, but you're like, hey, nothing's perfect, right? Oh, uh, yeah. So, so that's incredible though, because I, I feel like, if we kind of, you know, stitch your journey together and say, okay, you and your wife, you, you, you were in debt, you had, you had a car payment, you had a house payment, you're in a job that's not 100% fulfilling, like you like parts of it, but it probably controlled a lot of your time, you had to travel a lot, you're like, I wish I could do something different. Um, you try financial coaching, you, you probably you said you're working 80 hours, and I know you, you, you probably really enjoy <laughs> helping people, but it just wasn't it. And then all of a sudden, you kind of get in this podcast editing lane and like they they call you the Grayson Bell of podcasting right like it's it's yeah. like you are the guy <laughs> when it comes to podcast editing um, and you found a lane and and it's been awesome it's been awesome to watch your journey um, what's what's the latest thing that you're working on because this thing turned into a career and I was trying to find other people who were doing it I created a Facebook group for podcast editors and all we do is talk about the post production side of podcasting and it, it's ballooned into over 8,800 members. Wow. Uh, a friend of mine in the podcast space said, you know what? You need to have a conference for editors. Let's do it. We did it. It was March 6th of 2020. So it was like a week before the world shut down, but it was amazing. And we took the video recordings from there and started an academy. So now I'm actually training others how to do what I do with an academy called the Podcast Editor Academy. That is incredible, man. I didn't even know that. Um, yeah. Well, if, if people resonated with your journey, Steve, and they want to keep in touch with you, where's the best place for them to find you? To find me, they can find all my information at stevestewart.me. That's S-T-E-W-A-R-T dot M-E, because I can't get the dot com. The guy who owns it has had it since 1997. So he's really going to hold on to that thing until he dies, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I'm glad you got the dot me. And Steve, thank you so much for being on the show today.